If you're starting to feel the holiday stress, I have got the answer for you. So our Rest and Relax Oil by Radical Roots is hands down our bestseller, and it is so for good reason. This formula is so safe, effective, and versatile. Everybody loves it. So what we did is we combined full-spectrum, high-quality hemp with a Chinese herbal formula that nourishes the heart and calms the spirit. So it's great to take during the day if you're feeling any sort of anxiety or stress, but it's also awesome to take at night if you're looking to make sure that you're getting the highest quality sleep that you can. I take it almost every day and I'm certainly taking it any time that I'm recording a podcast. Head to RadicalRootsHerbs.com, use the code HOLIDAY30 and get 30% off of our Rest and Relax tincture through New Year's. Hey guys, it's Dr. Chloe and you're listening to the Radical Remedy Podcast. Today's episode is with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Heidi Lovey. Dr. Heidi is an acupuncturist and herbalist and genuinely one of the most incredible practitioners that I have ever had the honor of working with. She focuses on autoimmune disorders and has a special interest in Hashimoto's, which is what we really dive into today. Dr. Heidi is passionate about functional medicine and integrative medicine, and I am always blown away at how effortlessly she is able to integrate Western medicine, functional medicine, and Chinese medicine in order to create dynamic systems to support her patients and in order to explain what she's doing. Dr. Heidi does live and work in New York City, so if you happen to be looking for a practitioner out there, I could not recommend her more highly. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I do. It's always such a joy and an honor to talk to Heidi. I hope everybody's doing well, and please let me know how you guys are enjoying the podcast. All right, everybody, I am here with Dr. Heidi Lovey, and she is just an incredibly brilliant, kind, and badass practitioner. She's also a teacher and a friend, and I'm super grateful to have her here with me today. So nice to see you, Heidi. Ah, hi, how are you? (laughs) It's been a minute, no? It has been far too long. Um, no. Heidi and I used to work together in New York. Heidi has a beautiful, beautiful clinic and really, truly is one of the most badass acupuncturists and Chinese medicine doctors that I have ever met. So I'm super wow, excited to share her wisdom. Um, so Heidi, why don't we start with a little bit of background as to how you got into Chinese medicine? Because I love that story. Oh, it's it's such a heart heartwarming poor person story. Um, no, so I've never had good health. You know that about me. Like I came out of the womb with colic so bad that um, I'm surprised my parents didn't drown me like a bag of kittens. Um, I have always, always been sick. And so my health issues really started to around menarche, the time of my period around 12, 13, get worse and worse and worse and worse. But this was the 90s and nobody knew what the hell was going on, right? So when I was 18 years old, I went to um, do my, what is it, like the health exam they make you do to go to school, to college, and did the blood, whatever, um, go home and I get a phone call from the doctor maybe two, three days later that was just like, oh my God, thyroid numbers, I, you know, this was the 90s, though, and there was no Google. There was no, like, AI <laughs> chat. Like, nothing, right? So this was, like, 95. And so the doctor calls and leaves this crazy message on the phone. That's just all I heard was thyroid and lifelong medication. And I got my first bottle of Synthroid when I was 18 years old. And I proceeded to go to college, throw it in my suitcase, and promptly forgot about it. And in college, you know, you just, I don't know, like when you're young like that, you can kind of deal with health issues, right? So I'm five foot one if you hang me upside down (laughs) and stretch me (laughs) out, right? And so at my heaviest, I was 250 pounds in college. And what I was eating did not match what was the size of my butt. And, um, you know, frustrated, but kept, and kept getting sicker and sicker. And there's like a history of Lyme's disease in there. And there are other things happening. And um, so during undergraduate, I wound up going to Japan and had, had a great time. feel like I didn't really kind of finish that experience. So I went and I moved to Japan after school. And when I was in Japan, I was just general shenanigans, asshole, teaching English, snowboarding, drinking, 
Um, and I got to a point where I was snowboarding four days a week, sleeping in the car, eating a Japanese diet, and my weight didn't drop below 175. And I still didn't like really understand what was going on. And I mean, I was I was healthy. I was working out hard. You know, nothing was shifting. I had just incredible brain fog. I wasn't picking up the language the same way other people were because I'd forget words. And so a friend of mine um, who I was snowboarding with tore a hamstring and I was like, bye, bitch. See you like next year. And he was up snowboarding three weeks later. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. And he said, oh, it's my acupuncturist, Kudibata san. So went, uh, you know, because when in Rome, do as the Romans. And so, and my Japanese wasn't really good enough at the time to understand medically what he was saying. Right but on. this was the first, you know, like non-Western practitioner who was like, you have to take this thyroid shit seriously. Actually, like you actually have to do something about this. And um, saw him for like five, six months. And then all of a sudden my allergies went away. My cramps went away. My thyroid started behaving. My whole health profile changed. Just lock, stock and barrel. And I was like, oh, is this what people mean by health? Like this is like what it means to feel good. This is this is crazy. Like this is what I've been missing out on. Like, oh, my God. So fast forward, I moved to New York uh, October 20th, 2001, right after 9-11 and um, started working for a Japanese company and, you know, just life, right? And within six months, my thyroid tanked and all hell broke loose. And I started getting rashes where the dermatologist would call their their coworker into the office to be like, you need to look at this. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> and things just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so I went and I found an acupuncturist. I was like, this worked for me before. And got acupuncture and I'm telling you within like two treatments like my body started behaving again and I was like this is nuts so okay so then somebody said well maybe you should talk to an endocrinologist so I see an endocrinologist and they sonogram my thyroid and he's like this is classic Hashi's this is glazing and I start crying and I was like of course I have like a disease like that's (laughs) the Japanese name to it like all right that tracks that's on brand (laughs) and um so start seeing this endocrinologist and sends me to a nutritionist and I give the nutritionist my food diary and the nutritionist flips it back at me and says, you're lying. If you actually ate like this, you wouldn't be this big. And I was like, that's why I'm here. Like, cause this doesn't make sense. And he goes, exactly. It doesn't make sense. Get out of my office. Come back when you're ready to work. And I was just like, this is so dismissive. And they started putting me through this medication cycle and they put me on T3 and I started having fibromyalgia, but nobody was listening to me. And I was just like, uh, can I swear? Uh, oh, yeah. I, just like, <laughs> I mean, you're you? on my podcast, so I'm okay, pretty yes. sure. <laughs> right. I, just, I just need to. Uh, okay. So I was like, look fuck you, fuck the horse you rode in on, fuck your mom, fuck like all the way back into your family tree, like no. And so I went to Chinese medicine school to start and trying to figure out my seven generations. <laughs> her seven generations of you fuckers. And um, backwards and forwards. So we're getting 14 generations. And um, no, but, you know, that's really kind of what brought me into the medicine was my own health issues and my own health crises. And... Um, I decided to stay here in New York City to study in New York because, so this was like the mid-aughts, right? And we had access to uh, hospital rotations here. So I was able to do rotation at St. Vincent's HIV Center, the Cancer Care Center. Um, I did a rotation at the VA with veterans of foreign wars. Um, And when I graduated, I really wanted to be the HIV queen of New York because I had just seen such incredible things happening with Chinese medicine. I had seen T cell counts shift from 250 to 800 over a month with just acupuncture. And I was just so enamored and so in love with the medicine and what the medicine could do. And then I, I went into private practice. But what shows up at the front door? Hashis. (laughs) Hashis. <laughs> so <laughs> I wound up, you know, having a number of like autoimmune cases. And because it was something that was so deeply personal to me and something I'm so intimate with, I, I was pretty good at it. And so, of course, you know, autoimmune mostly affects women. 
And so I was treating a lot of autoimmune young women and then all my women wanted to get pregnant. And I was like, God damn it. Now I have to figure out how to get you knocked up. So I wound up veering into women's health because I was trying to get them all pregnant because so many chronic miscarriages, like just everything that comes with that. Right. Um, try, you know, and then just kind of followed what my patients needed. And now all my patients and my, myself included are perimenopausal. So now, of course, my Hashi yeast has taken on a totally different flavor. And I'm like, God damn it, now I have to figure this out, this perimenopause thing. So it's just, you know, that's kind of been my foray into it. And it's one of the things that's kept me in the medicine for over 20 years at this point. Well, there's so many things in there that I love and that are so important. One, I think the fun of our medicine is that we're always studying and there's always so much to learn. Uh, both from our patients, from ourselves, and from this brilliant lineage that we're so privileged to practice. Um, two, I think when you said, you know, this is what health feels like, you know, I think that that's something that a lot of people don't actually know. A lot of times when we get patients and they start feeling better, start having energy, start going to the bathroom regularly, sleeping, um, it's really, you know, a remarkable moment for them to realize that they have been living in such a state of disharmony. Um, mm -hmm. And also it's amazing how many things were affected by you getting acupuncture in Japan that were so beyond what you would think of as the, the primary target that you were working on, you know? So it was like the allergies also, the inflammation, the autoimmune stuff. So it's just such a beautiful example of how our medicine works in such a holistic perspective on the body. Um, one of the things I'd like to divert into a little bit, since I think a lot of people don't know, let's discuss a little bit about the schooling that you went to and that we go through as practitioners and what the licensure looks like. Because I think yeah. a lot of people sort of equate acupuncture school to massage school. And yeah. um, that's that's a very far stretch. And massage, I, I love me a good massage and that can be phenomenal medicinal massages not discounting that in any way, but let's talk a little bit about the school programs that we do have. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, when I first came out of school, um, I just remember, so I was like, I just got my license as an acupuncturist. And they're like, oh, I'm a licensed nail technician. Cool. And yep. I almost, I swear to God, I almost ripped out their jugular. I was like, you have no idea. And I didn't have any idea when I entered school. I don't, like, I really didn't know what I was getting into, right? Because um, the, the, the job I had, I worked a lot of jobs, but um, one of the, the main jobs I had was I worked for a tea company. And so I was like, I know tea, that means I know herbs. I'm good, this is gonna be easy. And you go to school <laughs> and you're like, oh wait, fuck, this is medical school. Mm -hmm. Like this is actually medical school and it's medical school in a foreign language that uses a written language like thank god like i i spoke japanese and i could read and write japanese because i made school a lot easier for me but the people that because japanese uh written like kanji comes from chinese it's a derivative of chinese right so classical chinese is modern japanese so i can at least like sit down and like look at a classic text and i can read the text i can't pronounce it i can't like read it like word for word but I but I understand what it's saying right and yeah. I understand when the translations are bad but the the schooling so in New York anyways the school that I decided to go to was a California based program because California was the first state in the the nation to require licensing and when you want to go down that kind of rabbit hole it's 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 pretty in Credible with Miriam Lee and how that happened in the 70s during the the Reagan administration uh, when Reagan was um, governor of California. But just baseline, you have to have an undergraduate. And then after your undergraduate, you go and get a master's. That's 3,000 hours of study time. It is simply 3,000 hours. And then in some states, they require about 660 hours of clinic time in addition to that. In a California school, you're required to have 950 hours of clinic time in addition to that. So once you complete your close to 4,000 hours worth of schooling, um, you are then allowed to sit for your national exams. 
And then depending on the state that you're living in, sometimes you have to take a further test than that. So we were one of the, up until recently, we were one of the few professions that had 4,000 hours worth of schooling and we weren't conferring a doctorate. So, and then now we have two types of doctorates in the field. So you'll see a DAOM. Um, and, you know, there's some debate about this because we are trying to lose the O, right? The the O word, the Oriental word. So like with good reason, we're, tr- we're trying to get rid of that um, and move more into like Asian Chinese medicine, more representative of the medicine that we are stewarding, right? Trying to decolonize the medicine where we can. Um, but if you see a DAOM, that's somebody that did a two-year capstone in addition to the 4,000 hours that they did. So they went on and decided to take a two-year research project. I have a DACM, which means that I just did additional clinic training and I did some, maybe like, I don't know, did 10 extra classes. Um, but, you know, and I've been teaching for a long time too. And so it's it's pretty interesting, the dropout rate that happens because people get into school and by like the second semester, they're just like, fuck, I thought this was going to be like crystals and sage and like <laughs> tea. And it's just like, Mm-mm, we are going back to organic chem, bitch. And like, you know, because we have to be bilingual in terms of Western and Eastern medicine. So even though our scope of practice is Chinese medicine, we have to be as versed as doctors and things. And in California, we're licensed as GPs. So there are some states where we're allowed to order blood work, such as Florida, Rhode Island, I think um, Nevada, maybe I might be misspeaking to that. I would have to check. But um, there's a lot of places we can order blood work and the scope of practice is greatly expanded. But other states like here in New York, my hands are kind of tied behind my back and I have to be able to work with the medical doctors. But we are the only license where we are allowed to, it is in our scope of practice, to move chi. It is part of our license. So we are licensed as chi movers in addition to like anything else we're doing. And I think when we think of acupuncturists as well, you know, there's actually um, eight branches to the medicine. And so there's five branches that we bring into the treatment room. And then there's the three branches we don't talk about so much. And so the five branches are going to be acupuncture, but acupuncture, think of anything with a tool. So that's going to be needles, moxibustion, gua sha, kind of anything along those lines where we have to use an implement for it. So we have acupuncture, we have diet and nutrition. People forget like how well trained we are in that. That's our intervention. Um, We do herbs. We do movement of some kind. So clearly that's like a tradition of martial arts like qigong or tai chi or whatever. A lot of people are like yoga teachers as well because that's a way to move qi. You know, or we do medical massage, twina. So those are the five. And the three we never talk about <laughs> are going to be um, meditation, feng shui, and cosmology, because it's what affects us internally, it's what affects us locally, and it what affects us universally. And notice I didn't say astrology. Like, I don't give a shit that you're Aquarius, Virgo, with Scorpio <laughs> rising. Like, that's not what it's about. Like, cosmology is about the universal forces that are bigger than us, that, in a f- um, that really affect our minute-to-minute um, day to day. And so, you know, you're seeing more acupuncturist Chinese medicine people move into uh, climate activism as well, right? Because that's part of the cosmology and that's part of health. Like we're no different than the, than the world around us. So health happens not just at the individual and societal level, but it happens at the global level as well. And the training that it takes to get there is a lot. And look, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm still learning. I am still learning on on the daily. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that really impresses me and brings us all together as a field is the people who stay with it are people who are really passionate about continuing to learn um, and continuing to grow. And as you said, the, the body is a microcosm of the macrocosm. And we're seeing what's going on within our bodies, in the environment at large. And that's a lot of the reason why I wanted to start this podcast, because, you know, we're decimating the ecology and driving toxins and killing off plants and doing all sorts of things. And we're seeing that reflected now in the dramatic increase in diseases, predominantly in children with neurodevelopmental disorders, but also in a lot of these autoimmune disorders, cancer, 
neurodegenerative disorders, et cetera. And it's like, we've got to find some ways that we can intervene and start taking personal accountability, both for ourselves, but for our families and in our homes so that we can keep widening that, widening that circle of health and wellness. Um, and I think too, you know, I, I think we have to be a little bit careful with some of the technology, right? Because I think, you know, for example, like genetic testing or there's other testing too, but genetic testing is a good one where the technology is ahead of the knowledge. And so, you know, a lot of times like I'm a big MTHFR, you know, like motherfucker gene person, like it's, it's a cornerstone. Um, of my practice. But at the same time, you know, the eugenics of some of this, like what gets turned on versus turned off, you know, what are other genetic markers, players, like we still don't know, we're still learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, I've been saying this for a decade that, you know, one of the next frontiers in health is gut biome. You know, I've been saying that because Li Dong Yuan and the Pi Wei Loon <laughs> treat the earth first has been saying that six, the 1600s, right? So it's not a new message, but it's a message we haven't heeded until like the planet's literally on fire. And, you know, it's we have what was the last like kind of apocalyptic doomsday clock. We have 10 years to get some of the shit figured out. And, you know, the planet is telling us, our bodies are telling it, the microbiome is telling it, the macrocosm is telling it. So, you know, it's, I find leaning into this medicine, right, and leaning into, and it's a medicine, by the way, that we're just stewarding. So this was here before us. This is going to be here, like, long after us. Like, it's not something you can break, right? But hopefully it's something that we can, we can steward and and take care of and like honor while we have access to it and you know the the other piece to this is we we have to be very careful between appreciation and appropriation and so you know we can mix it with western medicine we can steward it into a new age we can i use chinese medicine all the time that scope to read blood work You know, it influences how I I move through the world and how I look at the world. But at the same time, you know, you can't get on. I'm sorry, I'm just going to call it like you can't get on TikTok and be like, so I discovered this thing called Graston or Gua Cha to make you beautiful. And you just just scrape your face. And it's so pretty. And then it's like, no, there is centuries of like a history behind that. And so that's the other piece to it. While it's so important to continue to study this because there are layers to it. And look, like, I treated through the pandemic. I started seeing COVID before we knew it was COVID. I was seeing it in, I'd say, December 2019, right? And then I was having these patients. I'm like, shit, this is so weird. Like, you're 28 years old. Why are you still sick? You know, we're six weeks out. This is supposed to be the flu. And then we discover it's COVID. And then I started seeing long haul in probably May 2020, June 2020. And, you know, I was like, God, if I can just keep my patients off of vent, I feel like I've done my job. Like at that time, right? We forget like how extreme it was, I think. Yeah. Um, but I leaned into the medicine and I was like, Chinese medicine is the medicine of pandemics. So, you know, there were times when, you know, we, we have doctors that wrote, wrote, Tristes on what they were seeing when 80% of a population was decimated by bubonic plague. You know, so there's, it's like, okay, so let's go back and look at the medicine and was it teaching? And I, I really, really, really credit those historical texts. I credit, I credit the herbal knowledge, you know, and I credit just the medicine it's itself um, in keeping some of my patients alive during that time and not having to go back and reinvent the wheel. And so it's it's something, you know, I don't know, like I, I, I feel like it starts to burn its way all the way into your your jing and your bones the longer <laughs> that you're with it, you know. Absolutely. No, it, it really just becomes more and more remarkable every day. And I always like to remind people that um, that a Chinese medicine has been treating pathogenic factors out of China for thousands of years. And B, that any practitioner who is practicing Chinese medicine is standing on the shoulders of millions of doctors and thousands of years of research. You know, Mm -hmm. like this is not, as you said, this is not our innovation. This is us, you know, 
being incredibly honored to be able to learn from these practitioners and carry on their work in whatever small way we can. And um, and yeah, it's I, I was saying to you before, it's like I love nerding out on the Western stuff in some ways, but the further sure. along I get, I'm like, the less I care about the Western actions of herbs, I'm like, Chinese medicine has already created the perfect framework and I need nothing more than that. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just, it's it's always learning. It's always uh, growing with it and expanding. Um, and, I t- and I tell patients all the time, you know, that it's the same body with a different purview and paradigm. So like when we step into like the, the sandbox of Chinese medicine and we actually have a different set of tools to look at the same pathogenic factor. Because look, you know, Western medicine is great. It's very Cartesian and it breaks it down to the smallest sum total of parts, right? And so that's how we get vaccines. That's how we understand um, genetic disorders, right? Like, because we just keep going smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we find like that one thing. And like, it's a double-edged sword because then we feel like, oh, problem, solution, right? So we found it. What's the solution? There has to be a solution. And we get so solution oriented versus saying, you know, Chinese medicine is the medicine of relationships and it's the medicine of the relationship to the self. So what's the relationship between like the liver and the heart? What's the relationship between the heart and the spleen? You know, what's the relationship between the lungs and the liver? And so when we start looking at relationships and we realize that none of these things stand alone, And that there's always like a domino impact, like effect through the system, through the body. It it gives us different levels of intervention. And sometimes I'm like, well, you know, it's not always a cure that we're looking at. Sometimes there's the shit that's just constitutional. Well, that's the beauty of Chinese medicine, I feel like, is because we're treating the whole person and we're looking at the, the underlying patterns of disharmony within the body and restoring homeostasis. So... Some of those diagnoses, you know, Western diagnoses don't really matter to us and largely don't matter at all. You know, sometimes the lab work and whatnot can be helpful in terms of us looking at the, you know, the, aggr- you know, the, how aggressively we're going to treat something or certain different things that we're going to look into for our patients. But really, we're looking at it through the paradigm of Chinese medicine, which is let's get your body and mind functioning better overall. And that's going to support all of the different systems. Um, And that's why Chinese medicine is so incredibly beautiful for women's health. And it's something that, you know, that's part of the reason I wanted to have you on here today, because we are fantastic as a field in terms of helping women with fertility issues and with hormonal issues. Um, You know, obviously in our medicine, we don't treat any Western diagnosis uh, because that's out of our scope of practice. And you uh, just did we, air quotes with that, by the way. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just saying whatever. I don't know how much trouble I can get in for a podcast. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we routinely see patients with endometriosis and endo- mm-hmm. in- infertility and um, PCOS and all sorts of women's issues, women's health mm-hmm. issues that we're able to regulate just by regulating their cycle and supporting their body. Um, I'd love to have you speak a little bit to some of the experiences that you've had with your patients in terms of women's health and why you think that Chinese medicine is such a powerful tool for women. Well, you know, um, I'll just give you like kind of like another parable like myself. Right. So, you know, 2019, my my period started getting like weeble wobbly. Right. And so it caught like October 2019. It was starting to get weird. I was like, okay. The, the shift is coming. It's a little early for me, but with with menopause and perimenopause, we do treat it as physiological chi dynamic shift versus pathology. And so I was like, okay, you know, I mean, you know, granted, this was pre pandemic, right? So we started shifting and I was like, ah, this is too early. Fuck you. Hold my beer. <laughs> and like went into acupuncture and did like the herbs and got my cycle regulated. Right. And then the pandemic hit like a year later and it got weeble wobbly like from from the, the stress. And so I went and I did the vaccine. Right. Took vaccine one, took vaccine two and my period stopped. 
And now, would I go back and do the vaccine again? 100% absolutely. Right? 100% absolutely. I would personally do it. It is not correct for everyone. It is not correct for everyone. But I was also, I'm relatively healthy. I knew I wasn't going to have kids. And I was working one-on-one with with um, high, highly transmissible COVID in small rooms with really? people. So it was absolutely the right decision for me, um, even though it stopped my period, right? And so I tried to restart the period again after the vaccine, and I got a couple good periods from it, and then it was just like, wah, 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 wah. okay, fine. But... Chloe, I haven't had hot flashes. I haven't had foggy thinking. I haven't had any of the things that we've normalized with yeah. it because they're not normal. They're not normal, right? And so when when we normalize a lot of these things in women's health, right, I consider it some of it pretty fucking misogynist. And, you know, just to say, like, look, put your big girl pants on, you know, and like take a Tylenol and it's like wrong answer, wrong fucking answer. And so, you know, now the context of Chinese medicine, we have to remember this came from an agrarian agriculture, Confucius society, patriarchal, you know, blah, 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 blah. But we're considered the, the mother of kings. And so there is a long, deep tradition, even if it's coming from, you know, an agrarian patriarchal Confucian society, there is a long, deep tradition of treaties of women's health and how to treat a female endocrine system, where they looked, again, we look for patterns, right? And so, you know, with, with menopause, like the teachings are, there should be kind of like a gradual wind down with things, but it should kind of be like, oh shit, I haven't had my period in a year. I guess we're done. Like that should be normal, right? Not this like, New York Times, you've been lied to regarding menopause. Start your HRTs tomorrow. And it's like, no, take care of your body so you don't need those. Yeah. Well, and menopause is such a dramatic shit for so many women and we really don't talk about it but again that's the wrong messaging it's support your body's passage through this and transition you know it's a natural thing yeah and you know there's this um so bob flaws he's he's one of um you know because there's only like a handful of people out there that are doing really like deep translations of of things into english you know, and you know, as a practitioner that like there's probably less than 1% of what's been written has actually been translated to English. Now, is all of it like worth its weight in gold? No, some of it's like absolute complete, like utter toss, right? And like doesn't need to be translated. But then there's other things in there where like we do need medical anthropologists and we do need PhDs and we do need people like who are versed in the nuances and getting this into English and other languages, quite frankly, you know, whether it's Spanish or Portuguese or French, like, look, the French have a more than 400 year tradition with acupuncture because it started showing up like through the Silk Roads and they took it on like pretty early. Right. So, but, you know, to, to be, to be translating a lot of these things. So Bob Flaw's in one of his translations, he kind of expounds on this like really like incredibly like beautiful mechanism of how menopause actually works. And this really informs like my patient care and it forms the messaging I have with women's health. So now I'm going to layer a little bit of like Dr. Heidi's shit into this too. So like take it all with a grain of salt. Um, But, you know, in order to actually start bleeding for menarche, the first period to show up, you have to have enough blood to bleed. So, and it takes a while for the human form and like the endocrine, like puberty to like kick in to get all those mechanisms kind of like going to get, turn the machine on, right? So we have to have like a certain BMI. We have to, there's a, there's a lot of factors that start into that, right? And so again, Every single organ system in Chinese medicine has its own chi, it has its own blood, it has its own yin, it has its own yang, it has its own characteristics. So in order for 
the period menstruation to happen, we have to have, we would say, like in the in this dynamic model, for heart blood to trickle down into the uterus and for the jing of our ancestors in the kidneys to slowly be like released into the uterus and for these two things to mix. Now, this is the Dr. Heidi piece to it, but like I think of the uterus as a stargate, right? It is a portal to another dimension where we can actually grow like a person in our pelvis to allow a spirit to enter into this world. So you are carrying the power of your ancestors, the power of your form, your being to bring forth an opportunity for life to someone to have this like really incredible experience, right? So we're really spirit having a human experience. So, and once this this kind of mechanism gets going, right, and we start cycling through it, like, every month, like, we really are, like, the bringers of life and, and death, and we cycle, and we just have a different relationship to blood, and we have a different relationship to the endocrine system. Now, unfortunately, we are organic structures that are going to degrade with time. And so, in the natural aging process, if we were continu- to continue to bleed every month while we age, you know, according to the classics, the Huang Di Neijing, we're kind of given a hundred years, right, on, on on the planet. And that's not a hundred years in an iron lung. That's like a hundred like good, healthy, solid years if you take care of yourself and and you kind of again these classics. I think are really like manuals on like how to human well, right? Like how to interact with with the environment. So we have this like good solid hundred years. But again, like if we're bleeding every month, like while we're aging, that's actually going to kind of ding us with time. And we're not going to make it to the hundred years because we've degraded too quickly. So this is the only time that we see this happen is where there is a renegotiation between the heart and the kidneys and the spleen, right? Like these, these, these formative organ systems that create blood for us and so the spleen's like bitches i've been at this for like 50 years i am tired and you just keep like wasting this blood Mm -mm, i'm about to settle back because like i am tired like i cannot do this like this is just too much i'm like overwhelmed oh my god so the spleen starts to sit back which means like the kidneys which this is the driving force this is the organ system that's going to get us to that 100 year mark right so it's the kidneys that'd be like well i have to keep like putting this shit in which means i'm going to get taxed oh no 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 so it renegotiates we have this this the heart fire of the the heart renegotiates with the kidneys about the direction that things are going to move And so what it says is the kidneys say like, look, instead of putting the power of the ancestors into the uterus and you dropping the heart blood down, why don't we do this? Keep your heart blood and we're going to send the power of the ancestors up to your heart. So the first 50 years you've been in service to the family, the community and humanity. Now let the universe be in service to you. And so the last 50 years of menopause, we see wisdom, sageness, a different type of sexiness come in. We see women discovering their spirituality. We see them stepping into their power, into their language, into things in a very, very, very different way because the body is harnessing this call instead of like using it for, for the community. She's not able to use it for herself. And this is the message that we need to be giving. Like, this is how we need to be reframing the conversation, that that is health. Yeah. That's right? beautiful. Not that, like, she's menopausal and she's crazy. Like, no, actually, hormonally, uh, honestly, like hormonally, the most stable hormone system is the menopausal woman. Once she's passed, like the hot flashes and everything, she's not fluctuating anymore so when people are just like i don't know it's like so-and-so politician like they're kind of crazy because they're no like she's not making rash decisions she's actually like her brain is in a place that's stabilized and she's not having to deal with the fluctuations and like she's who should we, we we should be listening to such a fascinating perspective on it especially when you think of just the general theme of women in our society which is to overgive and overtax and that's also something mm-hmm. that I know you see a lot in your Hashi's patients as like totally. a pattern 
Um, yeah. And that's one of the things, again, with this podcast that I was like, you know, it's kind of a, you know, with Remy, I I, I gave and gave and gave. You saw me sure. until I just fucking burned myself out. And I was like, shit, there's nothing that's going to help there's this kid there. more than mm-hmm. if I'm a healthy, happy human. And like mm-hmm. I can I can burn myself to the ground for this child and I, I happily would do, do anything that the totally. universe asked of me to do for this kid. But I think, totally. you know, as as moms, as women, like it's a radical move to actively take care of yourself. And I think that mm-hmm. Chinese medicine really honors that. And I think that that's a really interesting perspective shift on menopause that I've never looked at that way. Yeah. And I think like and I like not to like shit on the profession, but I think, you know, again, this is why we have to have historical context for things. Right. And so one of the historical con- contextual things we, we need to recognize with Chinese medicine and where there is a flaw in some of this that does, I think, like contemporarily need to be corrected. Right. So there, there is this idea, um, you know, and, and again, we can we can start layering in like the cultural revolution, Chinese medicine, like mid 20th century, like some of these growth shifts that were happening in that time and what were happening with practitioners. And what we saw in mid 20th century is that there was a layering in of Western medicine with Mao. Right. And there was a period of time where they did consider Chinese medicine and acupuncture to be backwards and as part of the cultural revolution, um, they started executing acupuncturists and Chinese medicine practitioners. They would um, cut their thumbs off so they couldn't needle as um, kind of an act of contrition towards like the party. They would have students beat their teachers. I mean, it was a really like really a harrowing time for the medicine um, and for practitioners. And, you know, we have people like Master Dong who... Uh, emigrated and escaped to Taiwan, right? And kind of like opened his family lineage to other people. So, you know, that's that's a whole separate like historical podcast. But, you know, one of the things that started happening at that time is as they were layering Western medicine into Chinese medicine, they started making very poor false equivalents. So they would say things like kidney yang is progesterone and kidney yin is estrogen. And so they were trying to explain Chinese medicine from a Western perspective. And some of it stuck and some of it didn't. And one of the unfortunate things that stuck was this kidney yin and kidney yang thing. And so we understand menopause in the West as this decline of estrogen. And so if you kind of scramble the shit in a blender, the unfortunate conclusion that landed was that if es- if menopause equals a decline in estrogen, ergo, menopause is a natural decline in kidney yin and therefore giving women kidney yin tonics should correct the menopause, you're welcome. But what we see is like the the kidney master kidney yin tonic that we use is Lu Hui Di Huang Huan, which is actually a pediatric formula, which will work, right, for a little while. But sometimes. Then mo- <laughs> sometimes. But I'm going to tell you like 80% of the time, Lu Hui Di, that formula doesn't work. And yeah. so then practitioners will say like, oh, there's still heat, right? So let's put some heat clearing Herb. So we'll do a sure by Di Huang Wan, right? Still doesn't work. So when you come back though, and and now we go back to the records that we still have left standing, like pre revolution, like all of this, we go back to the classic texts. We see there's actually 14 or 15 different patterns for menopause. And one of the most prominent m- patterns is liver cheese stagnation. So women who are constitutionally liver cheese stagnant tend to have compounded harder peri and menopause symptoms because like we already established menopause is simply a shift in the chi dynamic later in life and we need to have the liver in order to shift that so you know when we kind of break our addiction to some of again what we might have been taught in our 4,000 hours worth of school and I'm Again, when you graduate that 4,000 hours, like you're just licensed to move chi and you still have to go continue to learn and explore and like study and apprentice and do all these things. But 
you know, when I approach and treat women's health, like I, again, I, even with the COVID example, right? Like I went back to the classics and I'm like, what's been done in the past? And when I have this patient going through menopause and whether they're Hashis or lupus or, you know, whatever in front of me, and to your point, it's just like, treat the pattern, stupid. Like, what are you seeing? You, know, you find the pattern. Always. <laughs> Always. You just treat the pattern. And it's just like, okay, so if we have 14 different types of of patterns for menopause and they're not mutually exclusive, that you could have a couple patterns going at the same time, that's the artistry of it, right? To figure out which one is showing up, then that's how we treat. That's the formulas we give. I love it. It really does always come back to the foundations of the medicine and treating the person that's in front of you and what's going on with them at that time, as opposed to the preconceived notions of who's coming in or what that looks like or, you know, looking at these things from a Western perspective and then prescribing herbs and acupuncture based on that idea of what is coming into your office because everybody's different. As you said with Hashi's, there are, what, eight different types of Hashimoto's. You know, we look at colds and flus. I always say COVID was a beautiful example of how, what variation there is and how any sort of virus is going to interact with their host and how that's going to present and what that's going to do. We had people who had no sign of ever having it. We had people who went through hell and did not survive, like many of them. Yep. So it's, uh, you know, again, it it just comes back to the medicine being such a beautiful lens to see health through. And, you know, I think, Dr. Heidi, you've done an incredible job of helping elucidate why it's so essential. I really, truly think that especially every woman out there um, should have a practitioner on hand. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's a great way to start building health. You know, the, the current medical model is a reactive medical model. Um, yes. Chinese medicine is a beautiful proactive medical model. I got into it because I look at it through the lens of public health and its ability to help with public health interventions. And I think, you know, especially for women's health, you know, as we've discussed, from from cradle to the grave, Chinese yep. herbs are going to yep, support yep, yep. you. And I, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, before I set you free to play with Lukey Lovey, um, yes. did you have anything else that you feel like uh, we didn't cover that you'd like to chat about? Yeah, you know, no. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's it's always when looking for an acupuncturist, right, look for somebody who's licensed, um, you know, good acupuncturists don't always have to be herbalists. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can have like fabulous acupuncturists um, who are not herbalists, but if the, if they are herbalists as well, they've gone through like a different level of of schooling. Um, you know, I would say one of the poker tells to be aware of is if you see a practitioner who is offering too many modalities. So meaning like they're starting to do crystals and they're starting to do this and they're starting to do that and they're starting to do this and they're starting to do that and they're starting to do this. So, you know, if they're deeply trained in these things and that's augmentary to what they're doing, fine. But like sometimes that's a poker tell that they're not trusting the medicine, you know, and meet with them, talk with them, right? Like, you know, you're a gadget girl, right? I've always seen you do like the most amazing things with gadgets, but those gadgets always bring you back to the medicine. They don't bring you away from it. Absolutely. And so to be looking at people where if if they are using these things, are they using them through the scope of Chinese medicine or they're doing them just because they think they're woo-woo and cool and shit. I'm, I'm like the woo, I'm like woo with the best of them. I love my woo. I love my woo. There's always a place for woo, right? But You know, and I, the last thing I would say is like, it's also about right practitioner, right person, right? And so just because you don't like the practitioner doesn't mean the medicine doesn't work. Absolutely. And, and there's, yeah, you definitely have to find the right practitioner for you. Also, Mm -hmm. um, what, so for licensed acupuncturist, you're going to see an LAC, but what is it? Certified acupuncturist is a doctor, like a Western MD? It's a doctor. It's like a Western MD. So there has been, you know, one of the things that we're not so good at as acupuncturists in the U.S. is holding our ground with the medicine. And so there's been a lot of encroachment with it. And, you know, if I were to try and encroach on chiropractors, like they'd, they'd break my neck. 
just they break my neck. Literally. Like I just, <laughs> literally because they could. Right. Um, but they have no problem encroaching on Chinese medicine and saying like, oh, Graston. It's just like, no, it's fucking washa, bitch. Like, stop it. And so what we're, we're seeing in the field is that we're having chiropractors, MDs, PTs, like rebrand, relabel Chinese medicine techniques and call them their own um, in order to bring it into their own scope of practice without the training. So we're seeing things like dry needling, which, by the way, is just fucking acupuncture. Very right. Because if there's dry needling, does that mean there's wet needling? Like, I mean, like it's a whole it's a whole thing. But like dry needling is rebranded acupuncture and without the theory, without the background, it's taken out of historical context. And it's something that I would call colonized medicine. It's also because dangerous. <laughs> it's also fucking dangerous. And so, you know, like I'll have patients who are like, oh, my God, my last acupuncturist was so good. They were an MD. And it's like, yeah, they took a 200 hour course. I've taken longer yoga teacher trainings than what they took to do this. So when you're looking for a practitioner, like I really like always, always go with the acupuncturist, always go with the licensed acupuncturist. It took a lot of work for that person to get there. And they did it out of like a deep devotion to the medicine and they did it out of a deep love for the medicine because, you know, you're not finding too many million dollar acupuncturists out there like this is not like a field of medicine we go into because like we can buy like that second house in Cancun. That's just not not what brings these folks into the medicine. And so really, like, you honor yourself by honoring that person and making sure that they're, they're well-trained. Absolutely. Yeah, I always joke that nobody gets into acupuncture being like, yes, I'm going to make money. Like, it is, it is <laughs> fully a calling. And it's, no. it's really hard. I mean, it's really, you know, it breaks my heart. One of the things that, that I really look at in the field is how many people end up quitting being practitioners who are, who are mm-hmm. phenomenal practitioners but don't know how to run businesses and there's not much opportunity for people to actually get jobs so these people no. are not only called to this medicine go through such rigorous training but then on top of practicing on top of continuing their study are having to learn how to run a business and doing that no. successfully in order to bring you this medicine so you know i'm i'm deeply grateful for the work that you do i'm deeply grateful for all the other practitioners out there. And um, again, I, I really appreciate your insight and I'm really grateful that you joined me here today. Thanks, and- baby girl. I always love talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Radical Remedy Podcast. The Radical Remedy Podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice, and no doctor-slash-patient relationship is formed. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.